So uh, we're in week two of a four-week series called Good Question. And uh, we're looking at four different questions uh, that culture, and if we're honest with ourselves, probably uh, several of us in here, um, the questions that we're asking about God, uh, the Bible, and, and the church. And this morning we're going to look at a, a common question or, or maybe even argument against Christianity and the church. And, and it basically goes uh, something like this. It's, it's why, why are there so many hypocrites in church? How many of you have ever heard that before? People talk about the hypocrites in church, okay? And here's another question. How many of you have ever said that before? And, ooh, no hands up. Come on, be honest. I've said it. I've said it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and maybe someone, someone may say it a little bit differently. They, they may ask the question, this way and say, why would I be, why would I want to be a part of that when they're no different than I am? And it's, it's a valid, it's a very valid question, and unfortunately, it can be a very, really good argument against Christianity. Now, let's be clear, that, that argument of hypocrisy, um, that's, that's, that's an argument against Christ's followers. It's not something that can be said of, of Jesus. Jesus wasn't a hypocrite. Okay, so that's, that's an indictment on, on people who say they follow Christ. But hypocrisy is not something that is really looked favorably upon in the Bible. If you haven't already, you'll want to turn to Isaiah chapter 29. We're going to look at two different passages. Isaiah 29, uh, verse 13. And then that's in the Old Testament, kind of in the middle of your Bible. And then we're going to flip right over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read a couple of verses there. In Matthew. Isaiah 29, verse 13, and then Matthew 7, verses 3, 4, and 5. Give you a second to, to find it. So here's uh, Isaiah 29, verse 13, and, and it says this. The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me, and human rules direct their worship of me. And then you turn over to Matthew chapter 7, verses 3, 4, and 5. It says this. It says, Why do you look at the splinter? Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood? in your own eye or how can you say to your brother let me take the splinter out of your eye and look there's a beam of wood in your own eye hypocrite and my uh my bible has an exclamation point after that so it was a pretty strong word hypocrite first take the beam of wood out of your eye and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye in, in those two passages, we basically uh, see that there are, are two kinds of hypocrites addressed there. The first one, the one that's mentioned in the Isaiah passage, is, is basically when you say you believe something, but you don't act like it. You say, that you, you say that you have a strong conviction or a strong belief towards something, but you don't act like it. Or if you want to dig just a little bit deeper uh, than that, you say you believe something, but honestly... You really don't. You don't believe it. Therefore, it would make sense that if you really didn't believe it, then it would absolutely have no real bearing on your life. A familiar, a familiar phrase that you, you might have heard someone say, or you might have said it, is if you talk the walk, then you better what? Talk, yeah, if you talk the talk, then you better walk the walk. Sorry, I messed it up. Let's try it again. If you talk the talk, then you better walk the the walk. In Isaiah, God clearly points out that their walk, in this case their hearts, uh, it's not matching up with their talk. God isn't, he, God isn't impressed at all with, with the show. What he's clearly focused on is, is our hearts. And God says that their hearts are far from him. Man, what an indictment. They, they are far from him. In other words, they're saying one thing, but their lives are going in a completely different direction. And you can see how that would be a huge turnoff to, to culture, uh, and, and specifically to a culture that is looking for authenticity. You say you believe one thing, 
but you act like that belief has no bearing on your life. And as a hypocrite, then your faith, it's fiction. Your, your spirituality is, is really Sunday only. Your, your Christianity is only when it's maybe convenient for you, where it fits your agenda or it fits your, your timetable. Being a follower of Christ is more than just, more than just coming to church. And the people that God is referring to here in Isaiah, they were coming to worship. They were coming to church. They were doing the religious thing. They were playing by the religious rules, but it wasn't changing who they were as people. And here's an interesting question to ask yourself. If I stopped believing, let's just say you are a follower of Christ, and ask yourself this question. If I stop believing in God right now, would my life look any different? If I stop believing in God right now, would my life look any different? And here's the other thing. Would anyone, would anyone even notice? Would even, could anyone even tell a difference? You can imagine how confusing this would be to an outside culture who hears Christians say one thing but live out something totally different. Uh, the type of hypocrite that's addressed in, in, uh, Matthew, in the Matthew passage, and this is a, this is a real popular one uh, in churches, is when you look down on or you're critical of others when you are just as flawed. When you are just as flawed. Again, this is a confusing and very off-putting issue inside the church to people who are on the outside looking in. And I, I love the humor that Jesus uses here. I mean, it's, it's basically this. It's, you know, why are you looking at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log coming out of your eye? I mean, you're walking around pointing things out um, and, 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 and pointing things out in people's life, but you have this ginormous thing in your eye. And you're not, you're not at all dealing with it. Now, let in your Bible may actually use the word log. That my, mine says wooden beam. I, you know, sometimes when I was first reading this passage, when I was first was familiar with it, you know, growing up, I, I used to think about a telephone pole, and it would really make me laugh. Uh, now, so now when you see a tele, you know, electrical poles out there, I want you to think about this. But it's like, you know, you've got this thing in your eye, and all you're concerned about is, hey, let me, and you realize, too, if you try to help someone else, you can't, because what? You can't even reach and you're just going to knock them around with a huge beam in your eye. And, and, but let me, let me say this, and I, I, I don't want you to miss this. The idea is not that we shouldn't help others with the specks in their eyes. Scripture is clear that we should look out for our Christian brothers and sisters and help them in, in lovingly and very humble ways. I mean, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, 2 Timothy 4, 2, Jude 22 and 23, Galatians 6, 1. Those are just a few passages that talk about helping one another. But the idea here that, Matthew, that Jesus is talking about in Matthew is that we are, that we are so prideful that we don't even see the, the issues in our own lives. And, and that we're pointing out in, in other people's lives that, they're, that we're struggling uh, just as much as they are. Or, or, or we, don't even, we don't even know that we're struggling at all or don't want to admit that we're struggling at all. Or here's what we do. Yeah, this is my issue. But, I mean, this is a pool noodle. I mean, I don't have a light pole like that guy sticking out of my eye. My, my issue, it's minor. I mean, no, it's not even a deal. But that lady over there, whoo, or that guy over there, or have you seen their marriages? Have you seen their kids? Have you done, you know, and it's all this stuff. We don't, we, we don't, ours doesn't even compare. And here's the crazy thing. And to some extent, the issue can be greater in us than it is in the people that we're trying to point out. This type of hypocrisy, it basically looks like this in, in the real world. You talk about, and I'll just use an example since, since uh, I'm a husband. You talk about what it means to be a loving husband, uh, an attentive husband. Uh, and, and you're quick to point out when you see other men who are not doing uh, the, the whole husband thing correct. Meanwhile, in your home, your wife feels neglected. She feels unheard. She feels unloved. She feels unprioritized. She feels unwanted. 
But that's the thing, though. You, we, we get so eager. We're so excited. We're so willing to point out the sin in others, but we fail to recognize that we have our own issues to deal with. You, you see the problem there? I, I, I've known someone um, for a long time who loves, loves to give these little mini sermons um, on how everyone else should live their lives. Um, he's quick to point out where others are wrong, uh, how they're mistreating other people, and, and he's quick to criticize other people. And here's the other thing. He's quick to give Scripture to back up his claims. And mind you, what he's saying isn't always wrong. There is some truth to what he's saying. But what drives me bananas, and I'm just speaking for me when it comes to this person, I'll just be honest with you, is that what he's pointing out in others, there's giant pool noodles, giant telephone poles that are in his eye that he seemingly ignores or just completely misses. And you know what that does? It certainly doesn't draw people into the Lord. It pushes them away. And you know who tends to agree with him? Who gives him the most amens when he goes off and starts doing his thing? It's all the other pool noodle things sticking out of their eyes. They're all, preach it, preach it, you're right. Oh yeah, what a, oh, so-and-so. Yep, so-and-so is that, oh, why so-and-so? And so we've got the pool noodle club Amen in one another. And meanwhile, it's, 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 driving, it's driving out a culture who wants nothing to do with it. But back to the original question. Why are there so many hypocrites in church? I'll tell you why. Because there are people in church. You see, we don't, we don't, we don't card you at the door. We don't have the ability to look at hearts and say, you know, scan you kind of old Star Trek thing and just kind of scan, oh, hypocrite, uh, can't come in. Uh, genuine follower, come on. No, it, it doesn't work that way. We don't know. And so there, there are people, and as long as people walk in those doors or the doors of, of church, there's going to be hypocrites in church. You know what the word hypocrite, where, where it came from? It's, it's actually a term that, from the Greek that means actor. And it literally means one who wears a mask. And I don't, don't think Batman or Lone Ranger, but, but in, in early Greek theater, and a lot of you know this, the actors, they would play several different parts. They didn't have a lot of actors, and, and, and so one actor would play several different parts, and the way that the actor would differentiate between the characters he was playing um, would be by, by holding up a mask to their face. You see, they were pretending to be someone or something that they were not. And in churches today, we have a lot of, of actors playing parts. Some of you here this morning, you might have come in here with a mask. You're playing a part. You're here to look like you're, you're a good Christian. Or you're here because you want to act like, hey, I, I want everyone to know that I've got it all together. Or you may be here so that you can look down on everyone else Who's, who's not here? Or you may be here so you can, you can, uh, <laughs> you can get together with all of the, uh, the, the, the pool noodle crowd and uh, y'all can all meet together and, and you can talk about all the problems in the world and what's wrong with everyone, everyone else and, and, and so we can um, blame the world's problems on, on the immigrants or the politicians or the, the left side or the right side or the rich, or the poor, or all, all those sinners out there. But if we're honest with ourselves, we've got, we've got actors in here. And unfortunately, that acting, it doesn't win awards. What it does is it just pushes people away from Christ and pushes people away from His church. But I also want to say this, okay? I want to say this. People misunderstand what church is all about. Um, Chad... Um, self, our pastor. For those of you who are, are visiting today, I'm not pastor. I'm, I'm on staff, but our, our pastor is leading a, a first steps class today. But our pastor, he uses this phrase a lot. He says, the church is a hospital for sinners, and it's not a museum for saints. Unfortunately, and, and I would say unfairly sometimes, people, people think, when people think Christian, they just they automatically assume perfection. And, he, and here's what I mean by that. It, if you call yourself a Christian or a follower of Christ, 
or a disciple of Christ, then that means that you can't make, you're not supposed to make mistakes. And as soon as you do, it's, it's kind of like this gotcha game. Uh, almost like people are waiting, waiting for Christians to make a mistake so that they can use that as a reason to discredit the church or our faith. And I, and I want to tell you this, and, and I want you to be clear. Uh, I, I want to be clear. Being a follower of Christ and making a mistake, that doesn't make you a hypocrite. It just makes you human. You're human. And the church is filled with imperfect people. And uh, I'll just, I'll raise my hand and say, I, I'm chief among them. I'm imperfect. Look at the person next to you and tell them, I'm imperfect. No, don't say you're imperfect. Say, I'm imperfect. <laughs> See, notice that? That, was, that changed everything for you guys. If I would have said, tell the person next to you, you're imperfect, you'd be like, you're imperfect. But if I say, look to him and say, I'm imperfect, you're all like, I don't know, you know. You know, it's like, oh, I'm imperfect. <coughs> for perfect. But yeah, we're imperfect people. Um, and the church is a place where imperfect people go to find a relationship with a perfect God and seek to become more like Him every day. To quote the, the, the not so great Jason Garrett, it's a process. It's a process. I'm just kidding. I love Jason Garrett, and I want him to win a Super Bowl very, 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 very badly. Every day is an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity to live for the Lord and surrender our lives to Him. But it also means that we sometimes, we're going to choose to live selfishly. It's a constant battle, which the Bible calls a battle between the flesh and the Spirit. And there's a difference between being a hypocrite and making mistakes in life. Just because we're not perfect doesn't mean that God can't use us. Just look, look in, in the Bible. Just read this. Um, and you'll, you'll see example after example of God using imperfect people to accomplish His perfect will in this world. And it's still true today. God uses broken vessels like you, broken vessels like me, to do His will on earth. But I want to warn you, don't use that as an excuse. Because I can, I can already see it. Well, what did you think? I'm imperfect. I'm imperfect. So, of course, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. No. That's, that's the, the difference between being, being a hypocrite and being uh, an imperfect human is the heart. The heart. A hypocrite, their heart is, is focused on self and self-agenda, self-priority. But being a follower of Christ means that your heart is focused on Christ and doing what he's called us to do. We're not, we're not perfect. And, and saying, using that as a license to do whatever you want to do is, is not a good thing. It's like saying, you know what? God's going to forgive me, so I'm just going to do whatever it is I want to do. And there, there that's, that's a bigger issue. That, that's a hard issue. It's like telling your spouse, why are you mad that I ignore you? Why are you mad that I'm mean to you? Why are you mad that I cheat on you? You know I'm imperfect. That doesn't work in a marriage relationship, does it? And it doesn't work in a relationship with the Lord either. That doesn't, that doesn't fly. So, so what do we do then? How do we, how do we stop acting and start living like Christ followers? And by the way, if, if, you're, if you're here today and you are not a, a Christian, you're not a Christ follower, you're checking out church, you're checking out this God thing, I want you to know that, that this message really is not for you. It's, it's, for the, it's for Christians. It's for believers. And the next things we're going to talk about, I, I they apply to Christians, but I think they would also apply to you because they're just good, good rules to live your life by. But I, I just wanted you to know that, that I'm, I'm talking to, to, to Christians, but I, I'm talking to us today. So I want to share with you just three quick applications for this to how do we stop acting and we start living like Christ followers. And the first one is this, and these are real simple. Watch what you say. Watch what you say. Uh, James 1.26, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is what? Say it again. Worthless. Worthless. Words have power. They have power to build up, and they have power to destroy. We all know this. This isn't something that's new to you. You know this. We, we can all probably right now think of something that someone said to us years ago that either built us up 
or it tore us down. And even though it happened years ago, you can still hear that in your head. Why? Because words have power. But did you notice what, what, what James said? James, the brother of Jesus, by the way, who wrote this, he said about words, he says, if we don't control what we say as believers, then that will render our testimony worthless. Worthless. The message version uh, of the Bible says it this way. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. I love this part. It says, this kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. You see, now, if you've paid attention to our world lately, uh, you know that, that people are going at each other, attacking each other with their words. It's on the news. You, you see it on social media. Um, it's, it's everywhere. There's name-calling. There's hate speech. There's uh, racist comments. There's people who are being antagonizing. There's, there's demeaning speech. There's belittling speech. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. And it's one thing to see a lost world that's caught up in this because they're, they're not followers of Christ. You expect people who don't know Christ to act like people who don't know Christ. I, I always get kind of funny. It kind of amuses me a little bit about people who get angry at someone who doesn't believe in Christ. We get angry at their actions. I'm just thinking, well, what, what, what did you expect them to do? People who don't know Christ are going to act like people who don't know Christ. But the heartbreaking thing is, the frustrating thing is, is when we see believers caught up in all of that. Some of the most vocal, some of the most negative, some of the most critical, some of the most mean, some of the most demeaning people are carrying the banner of Christ. and they believe because it matches their political view, then it's okay to be mean. It's okay to be demeaning. It's okay to be belittling. It's okay to, to, to speak hate. And it's not, unfortunately, that's not drawing people to Christ. It's pushing people away. I, now, I, again, I'm not advocating that we don't speak truth. But what I am saying is we have to speak truth wrapped up in love. God has called us to be lights in a dark world. He didn't call us to, to mean people into the kingdom. He didn't call us to hate people into the kingdom. He didn't call us to exclude people into the kingdom. He didn't call us to judge people into the kingdom. He called us to point people to Christ with our actions and with our words. Now, before you email me, which my email is jeff.mize at fbcallen.org, before you email me or at me on social media, I'm not saying that we should be soft on sin. Please don't hear me say that. But some of us are so quick to go after the sin that we don't have any care or any concern for the sinner. We're so quick to go after the sin that we don't care about the sinner. And here's something else. We can't assume that everyone around us thinks or believes just like we do, even here in church. Did you know that right here in this church, there are people that believe that Diet Pepsi is better than Diet Coke? What an atrocity! <laughs> but I would never walk into a BFG or walk into the hallways, or walk into this worship center and, and say, you know, there are losers in this world who think Diet Pepsi is better than Diet Coke. Because you know who I just might have said that to? Someone who loves Diet Pepsi. We can't assume that everyone that's around us believes the way that we believe. So much damage is done in the church by assuming that everyone around us thinks like we do, believes like we do, votes like we do. We have to be careful that our words don't render our witness ineffective. We need to control our tongues. If, we, if we're known for something, let us be known for, uh, uh, as believers or as a church that's about building up and not tearing down. We have to watch what we say. A second application point is, is we need to live humbly. We need to live humbly. Luke 18, 9 through 14 says this, To some who were confident of their own righteousness, okay, this is Jesus, he's talking to people who are, who are proud of their righteousness, proud of their Christianity. They were, 
you know, they, were, they weren't afraid to, to flaunt it. And they looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. For those of you that are new to Scripture, uh, a, a Pharisee was someone who was a religious leader. And a tax collector, in, in what they're talking about here, it's not going after accountants, but a tax collector was someone who was considered to be a sinner because they were cheaters. They would cheat. Um, they, they were hired by the, by the Roman government to, to collect taxes from their own people. And so they would collect the taxes that the Romans required, but then they would also collect the tax of, of their own people. They, they would also collect an extra on top of that. So Romans required, let's just say, $5. Well, they would collect $10 give five to the Roman government, keep five for themselves. And the reason why they were so hated is because they were cheating their very own people. So when it says there, there was, so when Jesus says there was a Pharisee and a tax collector, everyone would have gone, ooh, tax collector. And everyone who's heard Pharisee would have gone, oh, Pharisee, religious leader. So two men went up to pray, one a Pharisee, the other tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself uh, and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers and then he's real kind here he says and even even like this tax collector i fast twice a week and i give a tenth of all i get but the tax collector stood at a distance and he would not even look up to heaven but he beat his breast and said god have mercy on me a sinner and i tell you jesus says i tell you that this man okay now he's talking about the tax collector this man rather than the other the pharisee went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, Jesus saved his harshest criticisms for the Pharisees. And, and, and the reason why this is such a... Because, uh, you know, the Pharisee was praying, and that's good. He should be praying. The Pharisee fasted, and he gave his offering. Those are all good things. But, but you see, you, his heart gets exposed here in verse 11 when he says, I thank you that I am not like other people you see he was so he got so caught up in his own self-righteousness that he completely completely misses the fact that self-righteousness is not real righteousness at all real righteousness righteousness that comes from god happens when we humbly come before a holy and perfect god and understand that the only way that we have salvation the only way that we have forgiveness is because of the mercy and grace of god you see the pharisee's heart was this I'm good, so God loves me. I'm good, so God loves me. But the tax collector's heart, the sinner's heart, says, I'm no good. God, forgive me. I'm nothing without you. It's back to this whole, you know, the whole wooden beam or the pool noodle in your eye thing. You're walking around acting like you're the superior person, but meanwhile, you're wreaking havoc because of the log in your own eye. You want to be humbled really quickly? Just walk around being prideful. In fact, God, God's word warns us about that in Proverbs. It says that pride goes before the fall. And as followers of Christ, instead of being prideful, what we need to be is we need to be thankful. Uh, thankful that God doesn't give us what we deserve. Remember, we deserve eternal punishment, separation from him. Thankful that God gave us what we didn't deserve. He gave us forgiveness. He made forgiveness possible through his grace and his mercy. Thankful that his love is unconditional. Thankful that he meets us where we are. Thankful that he pursues us. Thankful that he's blessed us with life. And honestly, to be a follower of Christ and then to look down on other people makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. As followers of Christ, more than anyone else, um, we should totally understand the concept of I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. We can't look down on someone because we, we were just like that person. And in a lot of ways, we still are like that person because we continue to make mistakes. We continue to sin. To say, I'm glad I'm not like him is arrogant. And here's another thing. To say, I'm glad I'm not like him, it's not only arrogant, but it's also an offense to the cross because it's saying, I'm good. That's why God loves me. That's an offense to the cross. In truth, the only good thing that's in you is because of Christ. He, he, what he did was he imparted his righteousness on you. It wasn't self-earned righteousness. It came from Christ. What we need to say instead is, is God, the only reason 
that maybe my life is different is because of your grace and intervention in my life. And I know that in any moment I can slip back into sin and to selfishness. So Father, help me to remain humble. Help me to remain grateful. Help me to remain determined to follow you in all the areas of my life. And God, use me to point other people to you. Instead of looking down on them, God, help me to pick them up and point them to you. A third application point is this, is we need to love like Christ. 1 John 4, 11 through 12 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. You want to know if someone loves the Lord? Do you really want to know if someone loves the Lord? Watch how they love others. I said earlier, God's love is unconditional. There are no strings attached. It's not, if you love me, then I'll love you. If you think like I do, then I'll love you. If you're nice to me, then I'll be nice to you. If, if you look like me, then I'll love you. If you speak English, I'll love you. If you vote the way I vote, I'll love you. If your worldview is like my worldview, then I'll love you. But to love like Christ means to love unconditionally and sacrificially. Anyone can love someone who loves them. That's easy. Sinners do that. All people do that. But it takes the love of Christ to look at someone and see them with the eyes of Christ instead of seeing them through our own selfish perspectives. You know what I'm not looking forward to in 2020? Matter of fact, we, we are one year away from an election. You know what I'm not looking forward to? I am not looking forward to all the election commercials. I'm not looking forward to all the debates, the posts on social media. I'm not looking forward to the news coverage. It's going to be one big royal beatdown. But imagine if, and I know this may be a stretch for some of us, but imagine if, as followers of Christ, we determined that we're not going to get, up, get caught up in all that negativity that will undoubtedly occur. We're not. Instead, we commit to the Lord and to one another that we're not going to be the reason that someone is turned off from Christ or from His church. We're not going to be hypocrites. We're not going to use our words to hurt others. We're not going to, use, we're not going to live pridefully because we think we're better than other people. Or, and, and we're not going to love people who just look like us or, or who love us. What if we said we're not going to be the reason that someone walks away, but instead we're going to do our best through the grace and mercy and strength of Christ. We're going to be a light in a dark world pointing to Him. Why? Because that's what we've been called by God to do. We've been called to use our words to build up. We've been called to walk humbly. We've been called to make much of God, not of ourselves. We've been called to love others like Christ loved us. That's why. In fact, let's commit to that right now. Let's not wait, let's not wait for an election year. Matter of fact, let's do it every year. Let's start today. Let's start today, right now, that we're not going to be hypocrites. We're not going to be the reason people walk away from church. We're not going to be the reason that people walk away from God. Not on my watch. Not on your watch. And here's some good news. Even if you walked in today as a hypocrite, you walked in today with a mask on, you can walk out of here a changed person. Even though you walked in here with, with some baggage, with some negativity, with some bitterness, with some anger, even though you maybe even walked in here and you're not, you're not a follower of Christ, you can walk out of here a changed person. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer a slave to the things that pull us away from God. You can choose to follow God. You can start addressing these things in your life starting today. God says to you and me, the past is the past. Let's look at now and let's move forward. God has redeemed you and me.